now, and uh, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then um, I've got notes for the whole chapter, maybe, maybe we get through it, it's uh, 18 verses. Revelation 17, verses 1 through 6. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and talked with me, saying to me, Come, I'll show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters, with whom the kings of the earth committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones and pearls and having in her hand a golden cup full of abominations and the filthiness of her fornication. And on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and of the abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I marveled with a great amazement. Lord God, thank you for um, the opportunity that's mine to teach your word. I thank you, Lord, for that call. And Lord, I thank you for these that turn aside uh, to come and hear your word proclaimed. And my prayer, Lord, always is that you would just open our hearts and help us to be receptive and help us then to apply it so that it would make a difference in our lives and in someone else's lives. And they would want what we have, become believers. We're more committed and more dedicated. Become more light and more salt. And you would get the honor and the glory for it. And that's my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Okay, so in Revelation chapter 17, John describes um, the Lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, describes a step-by-step -step victory over this beast that we've been studying in his kingdom. The great harlot is presented here. The worldwide religious system is judged and it's going to be destroyed. In Revelation 18, we're going to see the political and economic Babylon fall victim. And then in chapter 19, we're going to see Satan himself judged along with the false prophet. And then Jesus Christ will come and establish his millennial kingdom. So that's what we'll see in 17, 18, and then in 19. When this study of Revelation began, I pointed out that Revelation was full of symbolism. And that's why um, some people find it very hard to understand. But once you understand the symbolism, it actually makes perfect sense. Remember the, the Bible, uh, Revelation, the word apocalypse means to reveal, to uncover. And so the whole book is about revealing or uncovering. And so it's not all about a mystery. Once we understand the symbolism, it makes perfect sense. And we'll, we're going to get into some of that then tonight. Um, but why the symbolism? Why was it that the Lord Jesus Christ chose to use the symbolism. Well, if you're writing in 90 AD and you want people in 2023 to understand it, you have to depend on symbols and symbolism because over time, language changes. And so what was called something 2,000 years ago by the entirely different the way we would read it today. But the symbols never change. And they'll stand the test of time. And so that's the reason. The symbols will stand the test of time. And the language will get lost. Uh, so we see, we see that the false religious system is called the great harlot here. And the true church then is then um, the pure virgin. So you have this dichotomy then that the great harlot, the false religious system is called the great harlot, and the true church is referred to as the pure virgin. The harlot then has abandoned uh, truth and prostituted herself for personal gain. 
And the true church, that's us, the true church, has remained faithful. In other words, has not committed spiritual adultery. And so the church has remained faithful to the truth and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, every age has had, has had its battle, a political and economic system that has sought to control people's minds and, of course, their destiny. And so the opposite of the harlot, then, is the pure bride. And often we've seen the fact that uh, the church is referred to as the bride of Christ. The church, the pure bride, the bride of Christ. And the opposite of, of that, then, is uh, Babylon, the great harlot, the false religious system. All those names are synonymous. <clears throat> Each generation of believers has the responsibility then to keep themselves pure from the pollution of both the harlot, the false religion, and the world system, that's known as Babylon. Uh, the worldly system, its political uh, system, and its economic system. And we'll see its demise in the next chapter. This chapter is focused on the destruction of the world religious system that will be going on during the tribulation period. And it's referred to as the great part. All right, so verse 1 says that one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, and so that phrase in then uh, ties this judgment with the seventh bowl that completes the wrath of God. And so this angel invites John to witness the destruction of this world religious system, this great heart. So the great heart. The false religious system. This uh, false religious system is called the harlot. It's mentioned four times in this chapter. And her sin is called fornication. And along with that, you can put in idolatry, blasphemy, filth of every kind of description, persecution of saints, power, wealth, just pollution of every sort. So that's what we're uh, studying then. When we talk, talk about this great harlot, all of those descriptive terms are included in there. It says the great harlot. So this, um, the word great there meaning worldwide. So it's going to be a worldwide religion. And so there's already that being formed. The World Council of Churches is already a worldwide religion trying to pull every religion together so that everybody compromises, right? And so the purpose of the world church is to get the Christian church to compromise on the, the gospel so that we can all get along. You know, you gotta you gotta be taller. <laughs> and but you, you give up the truth so that you can be taller. Don't you ever do that. You you can't you can't have unity Unless we have truth first. All right? So the truth always has to stand. Well, the world system, this world economic system, political system, and this world religious system is trying to unite everybody then under one religion. The Antichrist is smart enough to know, and he may be alive today, but he is smart enough to know. He's plenty smart. He's a genius that to, to unite all the peoples of the earth, you got to get them in one religion. you got to get them in one religion. Because even in Protestant denominations, <clears throat> Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian, all the Protestants, we are sort of divided on biblical tenets, right? And so even in the Christian community, there's some division. But when you start comparing Christianity with Mormon and Jehovah Witness and Islam and Buddha, I mean, they're, we're talking about huge businesses. But the world religion, the point of it is to everybody to compromise, to get to one unity. Then the Antichrist knows that if he can get everybody on one religion, then he can control it. But you can't get people unified unless we all sort of believe alike. And he's going to believe he's God. And that's what he's headed for, right? Yeah. 
So this great harlot, meaning worldwide, is sitting on many waters, which also refers to the fact that it's worldwide. <clears throat> so we only need to look at verse 15 to get all the commentary that we need. And by the way, the Bible is usually the best commentary on itself. So if you get stumped somewhere, just look for that topic in other places and get, and get more scripture uh, you know, involved there. So the many waters are all the nations of the earth, every people group, every language, it's all inclusive. So that's that phrase. Uh, so John sees a vision of this sinister influence of organized religion, and it's without Jesus Christ. And it has um, poisoned or leavened the whole world. And judgment is now falling on them. Remember what the Bible said about a little bit of leaven will leaven the whole thing? We'll just use the word poison, and you'll get the picture. About a little bit of poison will go a long way. Right? Then in verse 2, there's a reference to the kings of the earth. And so um, another symbol then that talks about all the world leaders worldwide are on board with this. So the kings of the earth, uh, the false religion, the great harlot's influence is extended worldwide it's, and it's reached to every high place. That is, all the kings of the earth, all the world leaders, when John sees this vision, are all on board with this world of, of religion. So, um, and this would include all the world le leaders from the beginning of time, too. That's included in John's vision. All who dwell on the earth. Also, a quick look at verse 15 reveals to us that the great harlot, the false religion, the great harlot's authority is going to be universal. And the false religion, um, this great harlot, is going to be also the same thing we see in the worship of Antichrist. And so... The false religion will not only influence the world, but it will dominate the entire world. So, you, so it probably wouldn't be something like Catholicism or things like we've got now, right? It's just, I mean, there, how would they all come to one, you know what I'm saying, like <clears throat> Muslims and every, where they all come Well, you're making a they, good point. You're either asking a question or making a, a point about about it. I've kind of both in a way. I mean, <laughs> one of them open-ended pitches. Yeah. So there are uh, Bible scholars who believe that this world system will be the Roman Catholic Church. Because it's made up of moto. moto yeah, because it, it's a huge worldwide religion now, and so it's easy to get there mentally, and that's entirely possible. Um, <clears throat> but the anybody who can see this got a religious authority in it. It's always like a priest or mm -hmm. oh, yeah. somebody yeah. that's represented in the Catholic yeah. Church. Or yeah, I mean, even in our day, we're influenced by what the Pope thinks, right? Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, something <laughs> happens <laughs> and everybody wants to know, what's Pope think? I don't. <laughs> Sorry. No, I don't. <laughs> Yeah, for those of you listening, I don't. Yeah. <laughs> I agree with you. <laughs> but I mean, so like nowadays, everybody wants to feel good. They're, you know, people put God, they make up their own gods, basically. Yes. So they can say Jesus. it's Jesus, and but just say it, he wouldn't do this. He's loving and he does it. And then it'd be that kind of religion. I guess that's kind of what I was getting at. Yeah. That, you know, or... Tolerant. Yeah. Yeah. Because even the... Let's get the gospel. Yeah. And basically, it gets everything. I mean, the oh. letters and birds, come on. Yeah, it's yeah, okay. Yeah, you know, that's scientifically impossible. And scientifically, biologically, it is. But with God, it's not. Right. <laughs> I mean, I've often said... Genesis 1 1 says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Mm -hmm. 
And that is perhaps one of the most profound statements that's ever been penned. If you can believe that, there's no more issue right. all the way through. So a virgin birth is easy for me. Yeah. yeah. He can walk through a wall. He can walk on work. He can speak worlds into existence. God's powerful. A virgin birth is easy. But to your point, it very well could be the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, I don't take that as a position, but I can easily mentally see it yes. and get there. So I'm just referring to this as a world religion, and anyone that wants to say that, well, it's obviously the Roman Catholic Church, I'm good with that. Yeah. You don't specifically say that. But that's another one of those, you'd be in good company <laughs> either oh, way. Yeah. Right? Either way. All right, so... Um, this this world religion then is is not only going to influence the world, it's going to dominate the entire world. And from the common man all the way up to the kings, the entire world will be committed to the false worship of the Antichrist, the great harlot, the Babylonian system, rather than the true God. Verse 2 also says that the great harlot committed fornication. And, and were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Uh, so we've gone over this ground before. The angel is not describing people who are physically drunk with literal wine, committing literal sexual immorality with an actual prostitute. Though that may be happening. <laughs> what we're looking at here is a metaphor. All right? This is a metaphor. The angel is talking about all the earth dwellers who are passionately intoxicated with the Antichrist's illicit world system. So that's what the Bible is saying. Um, so it's a metaphor. The imagery comes from Jeremiah 51, verse 7, and I quote it, Babylon has, got, has been a golden cup in the hand of the Lord, intoxicating all the earth, <laughs> The nations have drunk of her wine, therefore the nations are going mad. That's Jeremiah. And so it seems today. The great harlot, or harlotry, is the standing symbol in the Word of God for debauched worship, for all types of adultery, all types of false devotion, anything that we would put in the place of God. We've gone over that ground before too. We certainly do have idols in our day. They can be a person, they can be a place, they can be a thing, they can, you fill in the blank. Because if it takes the place of God, or it has first place in your life, whether it be person, place, or thing, then it is an idol. And uh, deny it all we want, but it's pretty, pretty clear, pretty plain. So whatever we would give our heart to is nothing more than spiritual harlotry. Spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. And so the message for us today is this. If we are unfaithful to God, it's the same as being unfaithful to your spouse on a spiritual sense. You are committing spiritual adultery. That's what the Bible says. If you are unfaithful to God, something else is in His place, Something else is first place and God is down the list. You are committing, we are committing, I am committing spiritual adultery. That's exactly what it's saying. Worshiping any other object, no matter what it is, is putting something else first place ahead of God. Verse 3, it, it refers to the wilderness there. Carry me away in the spirit into the wilderness. So we saw this uh, early on at the rapture, right? Wilderness there is a word that's um, eremos. It's E R E M O S. E R E M O S. E R E. With one of them marks on stuff, which is for punctuation of some kind. It means, that's a Greek term, a deserted, desolate wasteland. 
just like where Babylon presently sits today. King has been there. It's a desert. It's a desert. John sees a woman then, this Babylonian harlot, this world religious system, and, and she's sitting on a scarlet beast. That is a reference to the Antichrist. So the woman is the harlot, the, the world religious system, and this world religion system then is sitting on or riding on the Antichrist, a scarlet beast, Antichrist. Woman is sitting on the beast because that signifies that the Antichrist is supporting her. So you get that mental picture? The world religious system, the great harlot, is riding on the beast because the beast is carrying her, supporting her. But she's riding him too and dominating, right? Now that's going to change. It's going to change. We'll get there. I've already mentioned the fact that man is incurably religious. He, he's going to worship something. Although he may not admit it, he does worship something. And I've talked to many atheists in my day. And they will tell you that they don't, they're not religious at all. I said, oh yeah, you are. <laughs> oh yeah, you are. We have just been talking about the difference between creation and evolution. Evolution is your church, man. That's your religion. You believe it. Hook, line, and sinker. You swallow it. And that is your religion whether you want to admit it or not. So man is incurably religious. God made us that way. I mean, we have been knit together in our DNA, in the image of God, that we are incurably religious, and we will worship something, although we may not admit it. And so Antichrist, because he is smart, he's a genius, he knows that religion is going to be the key to uniting all the people on the earth. When all the people are unified, then they can be controlled which is exactly somewhat what's going on in our country right now. It's all about control. This whole thing about COVID is all about control. And I'm sure someone's going to disagree with me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you're entitled to be wrong. <laughs> the latest example we were talking about before uh, class started, and someone said, I can't believe they're going to make us give up our gas stoves. I've been cooking on gas all my life. Now, we've already been electric, but statistics say that 40% of the population cooks on gas. Yeah. Now, think about it. We want you to give up your gas stoves because you are hurting the environment because of the CO2 emissions and it's causing climate control. So therefore, to be a good citizen, you would want to cease from doing that and go all electric. Therefore, when we get everybody electric, we control the power grid and we can shut that down and we can control you. It's all about the end game. And so, that's the end game. With the diesel generator. I've got one too, as long as I get gas, I can. <laughs> but what about this, so the, the scarlet beast? So that's the royalty? Part of the yes. Is that where the. Yeah, that's my next note. Oh, sorry. <laughs> you just need to be patient. I was patient. just looking at the color. I mean, the scarlet. Yeah, color. you just need to be patient over there. Sorry. <laughs> I came in late and I didn't see the <laughs> So, point on all that is when people are unified, they can be controlled. And so that, that's the end game. Now, back to verse 3. Scarlet is the color associated with luxury, power, rule, and splendor. Just like uh, Dwayne was alluded to. It's also the color associated with sin and blood. So here's the picture. Antichrist will be a splendorous, royal, sinful, bloody, murderous beast. And he will kill those people who refuse to worship him. During that time, when it gets there, he will cause everybody, great and small, to get the mark. And you will be basically, those who do, 
But we basically said, I'm going to worship you. I'm, I'm, we're on board. And you're going to control me. And this is the way you're going to do it. Right? And so you don't take the mark, you're going to get killed when they catch you. Right? So he kills those who refuse his mark. And, and those that trust God, I mean, he is going to be furious, passionately furious about killing those people. All right, so the Bible also says here that the Antichrist is full of blasphemous, blasphemous names. That is, in his arrogant self-deification, he's going to take for himself all the names of God, all the titles of God, making himself to be God. This is where Israel's going to get it. Right? He's going to walk into the, the Holy of Holies in the newly rebuilt temple. Now he's going to sit on the mercy seat and say, I'm God. And Israel's going to go berserk. I mean, and then those prophecies about flee to the mountains and be thankful that you're not given nursing a child time. I mean, that's when Israel's going to be headed to the hills. All right? Okay. Now, verse 3 also says that the Antichrist is described as having seven heads and ten horns. Now, this is going to be dealt with in more detail in verses 9 through 11. But for now, I'll say this is a reference to the revived uh, Roman Empire. Verse 4, we'll, we'll get there. Verse 4 also says that the woman was adorned with gold, precious stones, pearls, and had a golden cup, which indicates great wealth. And so, Dwayne, to your earlier point, the wealthiest um, religious organization on the face of the earth today is the Roman Catholic Church. And um, the Mormons are quite rich too, but they're they paupers compared to the Roman Catholic Church. And I've already alluded to this golden cup. It's a reference from Jeremiah 51 7. The abominations and the filthiness comes from the golden cup. Now, in ancient religions, drinking intoxicated drinks was a part of the demonic ceremony or part of their worship service. They would drink this mysterious beverages. And so, um, Bible historians and histo secular historians, you just sort of put two and two together. Opium and cocaine, poppy, those things have been growing since God created them. And, and man always has a great ability to mess up the things that God created to be good. You know, we'll, we'll mess them up. And so, they were drinking this mysterious beverages, probably mixtures of opium, cocaine, poppy, whatever, until they were totally mind dead. And then they would be under the power of this mystery drink, and their minds would be so dimmed, but their passions, and this happens now, their passions and their lust is excited by this medicated drink, and they will see, and they will hear, and they will do all kinds of of stupid stuff. Now, isn't that true? Oh. I mean, people get under the influence of these drugs, they do stupid stuff. Get where they ain't even got to have drugs to do it. What you mean? They just plain stupid? <laughs> I guess they don't have to have drugs. They ain't got to have any drugs. <laughs> yeah. A lot of stupid going on there. So all this abominations, this filthiness then, is poured from a golden cup that represents demonic um, religions from the, ancient, from the ancient past. You know, going back as far as the Tower of Babel, that was started by Nimrod. We, I think, alluded to that. These abominations is synonymous with idolatry, which God hates because all, all idols are a replacement for God. And a holy God detests all idols. He said, don't put nothing before me. He said, I'm a jealous God. He's jealous for his people, not the idol. The false idol doesn't exist. That's what makes it so stupid. 
you're worshiping something that doesn't even exist. He's jealous for his people, not the idol. God wants us to love only him, to put him first place, because he knows what's best for you. And people that love you will do what's best for you, not use you. They'll do what's best for you. And God knows that the idol is just going to lead to emptiness, vanity. There's nothing there. So if God is jealous for his people. He's not jealous of the idol. That thing don't exist. Except the people's mind. Right, so here's a woman, the false religion, all dolled up, all dressed up, with a specially mixed drink, the satisfying drink, and it's offered in a costly container, the golden cup, in order to seduce the people away from God to a state of moral and religious corruption. And the end game is perdition, destruction, hell. And Satan hates you to the point that he wants as many people as he can to go with him. So he can laugh the whole time. The worst thing in hell is going to be a memory. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. I mean, the pain's going to be awful, but remember. Yeah. the memory's just going to be worse because everybody's going to remember all the opportunities that they had. And they're going to remember that they were duped for the dull truth for a brilliant lie. The end game is perdition. Verse 5, John said, And I saw on her forehead a name was written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, the abominations of the earth. So when John was riding on the Isle of Patmos, Rome was in control of the known world at the time. And he knew, he knew full well about the Roman Empire. He had lived in it all his life. He knew the history. He knew everything. He knew what it stood for. He knew its corruptness. He just knew all about the Roman Empire. And it was customary for prostitutes, harlots, to wear a headband that identified them as such. So John sees Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, which means the start of right? When the Bible says the mother of, then that was the beginning of it. And this all started at Tower of Babel. That's exactly right. You must have been a woman if you had all that mother on the floor. You must have got a big head. <laughs> Maybe she had a large forehead and you, know, you could double stack it. It's a better one. You said that the memory was going to be the worst thing. I think that, yeah. Now, do you think those people that go to hell are going to have any memory? Are yes. They going, I mean, you don't think they're just going to be burned up? Would that be the end of it? Can I read Luke chapter um, 15, 16, 15? The story of the rich man and Lazarus. Mm -hmm. It's a perfect picture of what's going to go on when people die. Mm -hmm. One way or the other. And Abraham said to the rich man, remember the uh, Luke 16. In your Luke. lifetime, you had all good things. And Lazarus had all evil things. But now he's comforted in your torment. The rich man also goes on to say tell my brother. that, go, yeah. Mm -hmm. Go it tell my brother. They, now ain't that something? Yeah. Now here, here's something that's in hell. It ought to be the life of every believer. Go tell my brothers. Right. I think it's going to be like the burning bush that Moses saw that burned but it was not consumed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be like that. You know, we're going to be, uh, I keep saying that. Mm -hmm. The lost people are going to be giving a, given a physical body that will be able to endure the pain. Natural and Yeah, yeah. yeah. everything. And the worm dieth not. Did, did I comment on that one time? Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, that's another part of it that's going to be miserable too. <clears throat> so John sees mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, which means the start of it. So the reference to Babylon here is not the geographical Babylon that existed in ancient times, although there was one. And that is where um, the time of labor was built and all kinds of idolatry worship started. Here, the, what the Bible is talking about is, um, is a reference to this world system. And um, the, the worldly resistance to God the world religious system that's coming. It's the great Bible because it's far-reaching. It's worldwide, far-reaching influence. So this world religious system is the source of all the false religions, all the false worship, all the blasphemous worship, all the idolatry, everything that's going to be going on that's despicable in the end times. So we've talked somewhat about ancient Babylon the original Bible was built by Nimrod. Nimrod was a grandson, or maybe a great-grandson, of Cush. Now, Cush was a son of Ham, which was one of Noah's sons. So those were the, the four couples that survived the flood, was Noah and his wife, his three sons and their wives. Uh, Ham, Japheth, and Shem. Okay? And so, um, Nimrod is a son of Cush, a son of Ham. So this is the um, African peoples. Egyptians, all the African nations were descended from Ham. The European, uh, our kind, our people group, all of us came from Europe. I would, I would bet 100% that we could, every one of us in here could trace our roots to a country in Europe, Germany. Our, my people, my Smith people came in in Charleston in 1730. And the original name was Schmidt. Schmidt. Yep. So, oh, huh? <laughs> so, all of us are European descendants. English, Scots, Irish, Germans, Italians, French, yada, yada, yada. We're descendants of Japheth. So then Shem was the ancient progenitor of the Arab people and the Israeli people. From Shem came Abraham, and of course he had um, Ishmael and Isaac. And so all the Arab and the Far Eastern countries, people groups, Asians, were also descended from there. So you got Shem, Ham, Japheth. We're a descendant of Japheth. Nimrod was a descendant of Ham. And it says specifically here that, him, that Nimrod was a grandson of Cush, a son of, of um, Ham, son of Noah. So Nimrod was entirely anti-God. He, he defied God um, with every fiber of his being. And he built this Tower of Babel, the city of Babylon, built the Tower of Babel. And it was in for the sole purpose of worshiping the heavenly bodies, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And so that's where we got the zodiac. And people still to this day worship the zodiac. And they want to know their horoscope and what sign they were born under. I don't know. Don't care. I was born October 30th. But I don't have a clue what my sign is. I don't care. But the original false worship and idolatry that has led to all the false religions of the world today started right there. And that's why John said, the mother of harlots. All the false religions, all the false idol worship, all the pagan worshiping, pagan religions, all got started right there. Right? 
And that's why mother of all. Now, Nimrod's wife's name was Samarius. And she was the first high priestess of idolatry. They had a son whose name was Tammuz. Now, there's legend in here, but the Bible backs it up as, yeah, it's legend, but it was a real legend. You get what I'm saying? Because in um, Ezekiel chapter 8, verses 14 and 15, you should go and, and read this. There is a reference, and Ezekiel is getting on to the uh, Hebrew children for worshiping Tammuz. So Tammuz was a false dude, but they were worshiping him. And Ezekiel was getting on to them and specifically referenced the name Tammuz. So it's biblically sound in that they were worshiping the false idol, right? The false god. Ah, so here's, and the legend is, is that um, Tammuz um, was a son of, um, where's, my, where's my note? I can't remember all that. I've missed that in my notes somewhere. <laughs> okay, Nimrod. Nimrod and Samaria. Two real people. And she was considered the first high priestess of idolatry. I'll get to a reference on that in a minute. So they have a son whose name was Tammuz. And so he's referenced in Ezekiel chapter 8. The ancient legend is that Tammuz was conceived by a sunbeam. What? Sunbeam. sunbeam. So, miraculous birth. You get the connection there? Sunbeam, Baal was the sun god. And Baal was one of the biggest false religions, idols, in all the Old Testament. was, was worship of Baal, the, the, sun, the sun god. So, a miraculous birth. And so, Tammuz because of his miraculous birth, was considered the deliverer of the earth. Does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. You see, the whole, the whole time, this false religion right up, up, up until the time of Revelation, the tribulation period and all that, is all about uh, mocking God. A copycat. Yeah, absolutely, a copycat. Remember, um, Satan is the dragon. Satan equals dragon. Antichrist equals antichrist. You know, he's the false Christ. And then the false prophet is the false Holy Spirit. So there's the Trinity, the false Trinity, the demonic Trinity, copycatting the godly Trinity. And it's been that way since the beginning of time. Copycatting. So the legend goes that Tammuz was killed by a wild boar and Sumerius, his mother, mourned 40 days. 40, 40 days. I mean, how many times is there a reference to 40 in the Bible? Right? And after 40 days of mourning, Tammuz is raised from the dead. Does that sound to me? Another copy. Antichrist had a wound to the head. We studied this back in chapter 13. Yeah. And it appeared that he was dead and that he was raised again. And so everybody wondered, because there was another copycat, a miraculous resurrection. And that's a part of the deception, right? Antichrist came back from the dead. And I literally believe that it was faked because only God has that power. God's got the key. He's got the key to death and life. God's got originating power, and he's got terminating power. Nobody else does. Antichrist is going to fake that to make people believe that he was dead because he can't raise himself from the dead. He don't have that kind of power. 
Somewhere along the way, Samarius would have been a Mesopotamian name, which means 3000 BC, you're talking about the ancient cuneiform writing. Somewhere along the way in the translation, Samarius become synonymous with Ishtar. It's in the secular history books. And so it is in the Bible too. Because Jeremiah chapter 44, there's a reference to the worship of the Queen of Heaven. That's her. Now isn't it interesting how um, things can get twisted and we can, and y'all have to listen real careful to what I'm about to say because I don't want you to get all crazy on me. <clears throat> we get our modern English word Easter from the word Ishtar. Now I know what you're thinking. Ain't that pagan? How, how in the world that happened? Listen, words are words. I mean, all of our language is originated from ancient languages from years ago, long ago. Most of our words come from Latin and Greek, which came from some other ancient language years before that. So don't get all bent out of shape about that, that you just learned, well, Ishtar is the same as Easter. We get our English word Easter from that. Now we're already thinking about, here's Easter eggs. Where, where'd that come from? And an egg, say again? What you think about it, I mean, it's all kind of come from pagan idea, a rabbit that lays the egg. Yeah, well, an egg. <laughs> so we can talk about Christmas trees and Easter eggs, and there's some. So we, we shouldn't get bent out of shape on the, the paganism part of it and just recognize what the spiritual part of it is, because there is some spiritual roots in the Christmas tree. Right. The Easter egg is a symbol of new life. Well, what is Easter to us? A resurrection. resurrection. A new life. And so, it's almost like the worst dude <laughs> in Pierce County the drug kingpin, sex trafficker. I mean, you just add all the adjectives you want in there. And he comes out here and says, I want to give Walkerville $100,000. I want to pay off y'all's note. As a deacon out here, I would say, give me the money. <laughs> <laughs> and so then immediately there would be like, what? Yeah. That's, that's dirty money. Money ain't dirty. It's how you use it. Money's got nothing to do with being dirty or bad. It, it's, it's not one way or the other in and of itself. It's what you do with it. And so I say, yeah, devil's had it long enough. We'll use it for good. That's right. And so don't get bent out of shape that our word Easter came from this pagan word. Um, Easter to us means a resurrection. And the Easter egg means to us a new beginning. It's a new life. And so just concentrate on that and you teach your kids that and your grandchildren. John Ann Nathan, a friend of mine, he's deceased now, but he always told me that these dirty words that we say, they're not dirty. We make them dirty. But I mean, in but in our context today, yeah. they yeah, are yeah. and they, they are, and they are but, offensive, and we shouldn't use them. Well, I agree with that. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, he made sense. In in a, I hear like you saying a, a bitch, a I, bitch is a female dog. It is. But in the contents you use it, it's not that. But we've slanged it, right? Mm -hmm. And we've misused it to the point that that is what it means to us. Which also goes back to a great point in that reason why John wrote the symbolism, that Jesus Christ wrote it in symbolism, is so that we wouldn't lose the, the meaning of the language through the years. The symbols would always stand the test of time. 
So that's actually a good point in backing that up. Samarius was worshipped, Ishtar, synonymous with Samarius, was worshipped as the queen of heaven by offering her a little cake made in her image. I'm not going to go any further on that. Jeremiah chapter 44, verses 15 to 17, go read about it. There's a reference to the queen of heaven, and they were worshipping the queen of heaven, Ishtar, and uh, Jeremiah was condemning them for it. And so these legends, these pagan idols, these false idols, are real in people's minds, but they don't exist. But the Bible does point it out that they were worshiping that false idol. So the Bible backs up those ancient legends because they were doing it. Almost seems like modern day Democrats. <laughs> Could be married. So this mother of harlots goes back to the Tower of Babel, the Bible. And that city has given birth, or has been the mother of, every false religion, every idol worship, every pagan religion since that time. And it goes back. That, and that's why it says mother. And from Ham also, which was, yeah. he's the one that found his Remember? father. And, and, and told he the other chose, two, and, he, and they put the cover on him when he was drunk. You know, but he's the one that so it started right. then and descended on down from it. That's right. Exactly right. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm, uh, I'm 728. <clears throat> we did get through verse 5. That's three more than I thought. <laughs> I think I should be getting the credit for it. Amen. Lord God, thank you.